Hi, and welcome to the Digital Guitarist uh, channel on YouTube. You can find a subscriber link and more info about us, as well as some other useful links in the description. My name's Rich Rath, the erstwhile digital guitarist in question. Uh, you're listening to Eric Parker on bass and me playing digital guitar with live manipulated beats. This is the closing cut called Disc Drums on our experimental improv duo replays upcoming fourth album. With introductions out of the way, let's dig in to today's mixing deep dive. Uh, so I'm working in Ableton, but I didn't start there. Uh, replay actually presents a number of interesting problems for uh, mixing because we have a few ground rules. First, uh, everything is live improvisation. We don't discuss it or plan it really. Uh, and uh, we'll play for about 60 minutes and record that as a stereo track. Usually what this means is we go right to the master in, uh, I use Ozone 9, uh, and just use that to polish things up without changing anything. But this one, um, we decided to break some of our own rule. If you listen to it in the context of the rest of the album, uh, it's a little bit weak as far as the mix. I think the bass might have been running through uh, a wrong setting, so the it was on a guitar setting, so it's missing the sub bass. Uh, and then uh, the bass drum, for some reason, is completely missing from the, the drum machine beat that we used here, a very simple and mechanical one. The drum beat itself was kind of a problem, being a little bit of mechanical sounding. Uh, so there were a number of things that we wanted to work on here that we couldn't do without breaking our rules. So what I did here was I inserted uh, a bass drum. Uh, I created a transient track, and I'll tell you how we did that in a moment, and used that to create a sort of percussive groove thing that followed Eric and my playing as well as the drum machine. So that kind of took some of the some of the machine feel off of things. Um, and uh, then took care of some off notes and other problems that we'll, I'll walk you through uh, before sending it out to get mastered. Um, sending it out meaning to ozone on my computer. One interesting thing I'll tell you about the making of this drum and a lot of other replay songs uh, is that I use my Godin uh, XTSA uh, MIDI guitar through an Axon AX50 and the cool thing about the Axon is it's got you can map uh, CC to where you play the string whether so if I play near the bridge it's up uh, it sends high value CC and if I play near the neck it sends zeros and low values uh, so I use that instead of a mod wheel uh, that I control while I'm playing and I don't have to limit it to the guitar sound. So here what I'm doing is while I'm playing guitar, I'm modulating the filter on the drums. So that's a cool trick for live playing and I really like that, that feature of the Axon. Uh, no other company makes this. Fishman, even though it has the same guy that designed the Axon, uh, no other company has picked up this uh, particular ability that the old Axon guitar synthesizers have. And they're increasingly hard to find. Uh, and uh, there's no new replacement. So I baby mine and hope it lasts forever. Let's start out with... Um, what I tried to do that failed, but ended up being useful later on in trying to get a bass drum into the song. So I use EarCam's amazing TS uh, Spectral Audio Editor. They've got three components that you can pick out and you can adjust them. Noise, uh, and then the sinusoid, and then the transients. Put in layman's term, noise is noise. Uh, it's what's called a residual. And then the, the tone part contains like the melody, the musical sounding bits that have pitch. So the residual sounds like noise, it picks up the percussion, uh, and then they further process that to come up with the transients. Uh, so what I did was just pulled out all the transients to this file. The problem with this for our task was that 
There was no bass drum in the original file, so there's no bass drum transient to pull out of this. While the, the transient file didn't work out uh, for what I intended it to, it ended up serving another purpose. Getting the transient file didn't get us a bass drum, so what I did was uh, I had imported this uh, with Warp On, so it picked up the right tempo for the song, 141 uh, and a half beats per minute. Tempo set up right. Uh, I added a uh, MIDI drum kit uh, with a Roland 606 emulator. Uh, more about that in a minute. And um, put in bass drums every every measure on the one and uh, snares on the two and the four. Um, this was way too busy, but it kind of worked. We thinned it out and put the bass drum every two measures and uh, made it uh, on the one and the upbeat, the eight, the first two eighths of the measure, uh, with the second one about half the volume of the first one. Uh, so that gave us a bass drum, and then when I put in the snare, that actually made things sound really good uh, for reinforcing the drums. However, it still sounded a bit mechanical, so uh, I did a couple of things to solve that. Uh, one was I put an echo on the snare, The echo helped create a little bit of a backbeat. Uh, in order to humanize it a bit, um, I went to the character setting and put a small amount of wobble. And so what this does is it shifts the pitch around uh, by slight amounts and shifts the time of the delay around by slight amounts, uh, giving it more of a feel of a real drummer. So once we got the bass and the snare thinned out, it still sounded mechanical. And at this point, Eric gave a really cool uh, explanation for what was going on, besides it just being a MIDI drum. Uh, so what he said was that uh, in New Wave in the late 70s, early 80s, the bass drum and the bass hit at the same time. And oftentimes the bass wasn't a guitar, it was a synth. Uh, and it gave that sort of slightly hyper quality to it. Uh, in post-punk though, they slacked it off a bit and you can see here, the bass actually hits a, probably just a couple of milliseconds. You can't actually hear the gap uh, as much as feel it. The bass is uh, just a few milliseconds after the bass drum hit and that gives the impression of a integrated instrument. It's still though, even after that sounded a little bit uh, a little bit machine-like. And the problem was that uh, real drummers play with lots of variation, uh, but our bass and snare drummer uh, didn't. So what I did, uh, originally the two bass drum notes were a loud one and a quiet one. Uh, I selected all those and added a little bit of randomization. So on the kick drum, you open up the kick drum and go to controls over here. And I put a random LFO at a slow rate, uh, like changing every measure or so, every quarter note or so. The, the pitch changes a little up to 1%, and the volume changes a little up to 7 So the So again, this isn't really perceptible as massive differences. It just adds to the feel of uh, an actual drummer instead of a, ma a machine. And of course... Uh, shout out to the real drummers. There's nothing that can replace the feel of a real drummer. We've got the drums mostly in order. We thought we had it. It sounded good on my system. Uh, but then when Eric and I played it back on uh, Bluetooth speakers, computer speakers, that kind of thing, uh, the bass drum was gone. Uh, so it turns out we're dealing with a 43 hertz bass drum. Uh, and one of the features of the 606 drum machine bass drum is that it's a pure sine wave. So nothing, there's no overtones or harmonics. So nothing basically gets beyond 43 hertz. And uh, cheaper speakers don't really begin to pick up the bass well until 50 hertz or so. And don't really give you full volume on the bass until you get about the low E string of a guitar played open. Uh, which is 83 hertz. So how do we fix this? Uh, what we found was that if we mixed it loud enough that you could hear it a little bit, hear the bass drum a little bit on the cheap speakers, when we went back to a good system, the bass was overwhelming. So here's the solution. It's, uh, I was pretty pleased that it, it seems to work. 
Uh, and let's have a look at our filter chain here. I'll close this one. And I sent the bass drum out. Well, actually, the whole drum track out to uh, a send channel, a send bus. And um, you can see up here, here's the send bus. It's cut five decibels, so it's quieter. Uh, and then I sent it through a series of three EQs. So let's look at this on a scope. That's with all three filters on. Let's turn them off. And let's solo this. So you can see when we put this on, it's a, a low pass filter set to twice the frequency of our bass drum, uh, which is 86. Our bass drum is 43 hertz and a very steep cutoff of 48 decibels per octave. So if we turn off the drums here, you'll, you'll hear it. That's what's coming through the send channel and going back. Uh, but uh, there's two more filters. So this is the crucial one. Uh, it's the um, uh, Hornet harmonics filter. And what that does, you can see, is it adds a louder signal at uh, 86 hertz, our cutoff point, and then some extra harmonics uh, going up uh, further up the scale. Uh, and that gives us a drum sound that sounds bassy still, but can be heard on a beatbox or something like that. Uh, so what this is, is the fundamental, the 43 hertz is turned way down, but the even harmonics are turned up since we tuned the drums to the key of the song. Uh, and the noisier harmonics are there to keep it sounding like a drum. So that's cool, but we don't want to send this dirty bass back. So we run it through a third filter that cuts basically all of our original signal out. Uh, so we're only getting these uh, harmonics, and it does still sound like a bass drum because of a psychoacoustic effect. It's pretty cool. If you have a setup like this where the fundamental is missing, your brain actually fills in that information so it'll sound like there's a bass drum there. So what that leaves us with is we're only sending back in the send return uh, the upper harmonics of the bass drum. And the purpose of this is that it leaves our beautiful uh, sine wave alone uh, so that we keep the overtone, we keep the, the pure sine wave for when you're on a good stereo, uh, but add in this uh, sort of cheaper upper harmonics version uh, over the top of it superimposed so that you can hear it on cheaper stereos too. Uh, this way, uh, when you hear it on the cheaper stereos, it sounds good. And then when you flip it back, you don't have to turn the bass up so loud that it overwhelms. Uh, that is pretty much what we did with the drums. Uh, these sounded pretty good uh, at this point, I thought. Uh, and we moved over to the bass, which needed some work on the tone, if you remember. This is where our mixing trick comes in because we have a unusual mixing situation in that the bass drums and guitars are all on the same channel. So that's going to create a challenge. Normally the way you would do this uh, to um, get the bass drum and the drums to work together is just uh, run a side chain compressor uh, where the bass drum scoops out a little spot in the in the audio of the bass. But because we've got the guitar and the other drums here, we don't want to do that. So we'll fix it by using multiband compression. Uh, here I'm using Nova's awesome Nova GE. I have the GE edition. The the free there's a free edition that's almost as good, but I've been using this so many years uh, that I really like the plugin. So I I bought the gentleman's edition even though I didn't really need the features. Uh, to support the developer. Um, but this is a beautiful sounding uh, uh, parallel dynamic equalizer, he calls it, but all you could also call it a multi-band compressor. Uh, so I'm sure there's a subtle difference, but I don't know what it is. What I've done here is notched out a little scoop uh, for just the bass drum uh, that the bass drum will 
the, the bass drum will trigger it through a side chain. You can see here's the side chain. Uh, and every time the bass drum hits, uh, there's a little scoop, but only in the bass. And when it's not hitting, we mildly enhance just by maybe three decibels the surrounding frequencies to warm up the bass a little bit. So let's hear how that sounds. <laughs> Okay, so you can hear how the bass has sort of uh, got a little pocket for the bass drum uh, without uh, really sounding obvious like there's a cut in there. Um, there's another trick that we did, and that's to use Ozone's low-end focus. It's a rather new plugin included in the latest version of Isotope Ozone's Deluxe Edition. What do they call it? The I forget, I forget what the high-end edition is, but... Uh, it's included there, and what it does is it works solely under 300 hertz, so just the bass frequencies. Here I've got the cutoff at 200 hertz, and um, because only the bass is working in our track, uh, what I do is reduce the contrast here, which basically glues the bass together a little bit. Now what happens later on is that when we master, I'll use this in the other direction, uh, in order to differentiate the instruments because there's both the bass drum and the bass going on. Uh, so I kind of reduce it here and raise it later on. And what this does is it kind of just makes the whole uh, bass, the lower frequencies sound more cohesive. So it's a pretty subtle effect, but uh, it does warm up the bass a little. And it's important to note that our compressor comes after that so that we can, once we've made the mix coherent, we can do that little scoop. So now let's turn to the guitar. Uh, there are two accidental open string notes. So I fixed those by using Ozone's Dynamic EQ. So pretty much the same idea as the, uh, the Nova and um, notching out here a very deep 24 decibel notch uh, right at, let's see what the frequency is, uh, 156 hertz. So uh, there's a sort of a feedbacky resonant note that uh, was an accidental hit, and I cut that out. But if I cut that out throughout the whole song, it, it takes away from the tone. So I'll show you how I dealt with that. Uh, stray note is at the end. So we just kick that in uh, at the end and it cuts out the, the sort of wolf tone, as they used to call it, a stray feedback note. Um, and then the other stray note I dealt with uh, in similar fashion, but without compression, and just went at it with a very steep uh, band pass at a, at centered on 500 hertz uh, that just comes in for a moment. And let's see if we can find that. Yeah, right here, and that comes on for just a measure while that note is happening. Uh, so it cuts the two notes out. Uh, and then to cover over that uh, sort of little divots that are left in the tone, uh, you can see I raise our side track here, which we'll talk about in a minute, raise the volume on that for this one. And here I just let it go because there's so much going on with the drums that it doesn't matter. It covers over everything. Okay, so we've got the main track set up uh, and the drums, and they're sounding more or less cohesive together. Um, there's still a couple of issues left. Uh, one is that these cut ends of the filters leave noticeable artifacts, and another is that um, it still sounds a little bit like the drums are machines and the, um, the playing is by humans. So, um, one thing we can do about that is return to our transient file to solve both problems. The transient track comes up to take over just when this dips in order to uh, uh, cover a, a too loud note. The other loud note is let's see, back here. And again, we raise the transient track uh, to cover for that. Okay, so let's hear what that actually sounds like where we have the volume dip. And we'll just play a few bars. So 
so you can you can hear it the bass drum and the um the transient track fill in uh where the overall main track goes down in volume and then it fades back in so for this one we didn't want to lose the guitar um but it was the first time it came in i was a little loud and needed to uh, i adjusted my volume before i hit it again uh but there's the one too loud tone that's sort of an artifact of making stuff up as you go so to cover for that we bring in the the um the transient track and let's turn as the last thing we're going to do to that transient track and let's hear first off what it sounded like uh to begin with little bit of panning the really beautiful Brower motion plug-in um, I got this from waves I'm not crazy about uh, waves uh, DRM and how they manage updates though um, but this one was a deal so I bought it uh, so what this does is it's an auto panner that works very subtly with the stereo field uh, and um, let's watch how it is in action when some stuff is playing so the panner basically moves based on the volume of the track that it's hooked to. So it moves according to our transients. So, so we've got this main one here, and then this these two bounce back and forth. So let's solo that. You can hear the panning is there, but it's pretty subtle. Like I've got it down in the mix so we don't we don't get seasick from it but that's pretty uninspiring all that does is it um emphasizes the transients in the song but what it does that's crucial for us is that it ties together the bass playing with the mechanical drums so uh it'll add a little more human feel to it because it's derived from human timing so let's hear what we did with that uh so the first thing was i found a cool effect called the insect effect uh and i put that on it so that changed our tone to this it's pretty static uh you can hear the panner moving things around a little bit but that's the only real movement so i added a, a lfo filter and then um, this is the part that I enjoyed. I, I hunted high and low for this. Uh, this is um, a free Max for Live plugin, but it's only free if you own Ableton's Deluxe Edition, uh, the suite or whatever it is, the full edition. So if you don't have Max for Live, you can get uh, there's a, a, a free VST called Transformant, like Formant instead of Form. Uh, so Transformant. And that one's free if you can find it. Let's hear what happens. So we ho I hooked up the LFOs. This one to the formant. This one to the bandwidth. And this one to the dry wet. So the voicing that you can hear there comes in and goes out. So here it sounds more like the old version and then it comes back in with the vowels and then uh this formant one changes what vowel sound you're hearing uh and uh this lfo changes the bandwidth so it, sort of the resonance of the formants um still it seems like it could use something else so i ran it through a rectifier so a little distortion to give it a crunchy feel and then the EQ8 just basically cuts off the harshness of the high end, mellows it out a little bit. And then Brower Motion is moving it around the stereo field as we saw earlier, so like that. All right, so now let's hear it in context. It 
adds a little bit of swung, percussive sounding texture that sounds like insect voices fading in and out and sometimes operating with human sounds and sometimes operating with insect sounds and uh, morphing between them and then moving the vowels around. So it gives the, the, you know, you do a second guess maybe in headphones and wonder who's like uh, yammering in the background and they listen for us. Okay, and then one last touch. Um, because all of this is taking place in the box, uh, sometimes it doesn't sound like it's happening in a real space. So to give that impression, and this is something you gotta be very careful with, um, I put on a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of plate reverb. So uh, really any reverb could do. Uh, I like the sound of the plate and I got it for free. Uh, uh, um, Sound Toys was giving away theirs and Artorio was giving theirs away as part of COVID promotions. Uh, now they're 99 bucks a pop. So uh, if I were going to buy one and I might actually own it, I would get Valhalla's uh, reverbs that it, the, the, he's got three or four different reverbs and get the one that includes the plate. I'll demonstrate it is turn it way up and pick a good time. That's a little cavernous. This sounds more like a big room. So that's the sound I want. I put a low cut in to cut out the bass so you can hear we're getting very little bass and then pull it way back. until you think you can't hear it. So that's about here for me. And then cut it in half again. So after you can't hear it, you cut it in half again. And what that does is it just gives the the sounds a little bit of uh, smearing around the edges, like it's taking place in a room. But you have to be super, super careful uh, because if you can actually hear the reverb, uh, it's just going to be a mess if it plays in a real room. Uh, it'll smear up your, your transients and just make a mess of your whole mix. I don't use it often and I don't use it little either. It maybe gets in every third or fourth cut if it sounds like it's too, uh, too in the box and it needs a little bit of air. So uh, the last thing we do is export the file. It's 32 bits. I stay at 32 bits all the way through. And um, I actually think that's more important than the sampling rate. Uh, the bit depth uh, gives you lots of headroom. Uh, so there's plenty of headroom to make algorithmic changes to digital files without creating artifacts that are just purely from the digital realm. You don't want to reduce the bit rate until the very last step. Uh, I do that in Isotope, but there's other places to do it. Air Windows, for example, has a whole bunch of tools for uh, reducing bit depth. Uh, so like if you want to make a CD, you have to get it to 16 bits from 24 or 32. Uh, so to do that, you need a process called dithering, uh, which adds a slight bit of noise under the audible level uh, that actually um, takes out the aliasing and the other digital artifacts of the conversion. Uh, so... That's it. I'm not going to go into the mastering step. Basically, in mastering, all we did was work a little bit on the high end, like getting some air in there so that the stereo comes out very nicely, and a little more work on the bass so that it has uh, enough headroom to travel between the good speakers and the poor speakers uh, without, without a strain, and just putting a final layer of polish on it. So uh, I can go into the mastering chain another time. Uh, but for right now, that's the deep dive into the mix. Uh, I'm the digital guitarist, Rich Rath. Uh, you can subscribe below if you see fit to. Uh, and let's go out with uh, a little bit more of this drums. Okay.